Resident Evil Extinction, a novelization by Keith R. A. De Candido. Chapter 19. LJ checked on his wound while he sat in the ambulance waiting for Betty. As soon as he saw the festering, bleeding mess that the zombie had made of his arm, he wished he hadn't bothered. He supposed he should have been grateful. After all, he wasn't anything special. He was just a hustler who got lucky. Now his luck had run right out. All of those people disappearing and dying, and LJ kept going. First it was their whole secret society with Alice and Carlos and Angie and Jill. Then Jill got taken by the feds, and they started picking people up, finally forming the strike team. LJ and Carlos were the only ones left. Alice and Jill had disappeared, and everyone else was dead except these last thirty, and soon, L.J. Somebody banged on the window, scaring the hell out of L.J. He covered up the bandage as fast as he could and looked up to see Otto's dome staring at him. A goofy grin on his face, Otto asked, How's it going? What? The date. L.J. rolled his eyes. Get lost. Does everyone have to know my business? Can't a man get some privacy? That was a joke, right? There's 30 of us, LJ. Privacy left the building a few months ago. Yeah, well that just means I gotta take it where I can get it. Now move it. So I guess I can't watch. Don't you got youngins to take care of? Chase is keeping an eye on him. Yeah, another blow from modern youth. Will you move it? Otto chuckled. Yeah, yeah, have fun. And don't catch any diseases. As Otto left, L.J. felt his face fall. He hadn't even thought of that. Betty was the finest booty call he'd had in a long time. But what if you could transmit the T-virus through sex? That would suck something serious. Betty came in, and L.J. forgot all about viruses and diseases, and thought about that smile. Nobody had had any kind of shower any time recently, and L.J. had finally started getting used to it, so nobody smelled bothered him any, but it was hard to find someone who smelled good. But Betty, she smelled fine. The paramedic held two cans of food. Refried beans, she said, holding one up, then the other, fruit salad. My favorite, LJ said with a grin. She fixed him with a look. Aren't we forgetting something? LJ stared at her for a second, then he remembered. Reaching down into the well between the two front seats, he pulled out what was left of a candle. It wasn't like the old days, when all he needed to do was flash some cash, and the women would be falling all over him. Nah, times like these called for some good old-fashioned romance. Too bad he didn't have any more Barry White CDs left. They started eating. The refried beans tasted like they'd been refried a few dozen times, and Betty winced when she ate the fruit salad. But they both were determined to enjoy it. Beat the hell out of nothing, and that was what they was looking at soon. A desert storm started brewing. LJ saw some sheet lightning in the background. It's actually kind of pretty, Betty said, staring past him at the light show. Long as it's out there. We'll be safe in here, LJ hoped he sounded convincing. Betty, unfortunately, didn't look real convinced. Things are falling apart out there. Trying to lighten things, LJ said. But we had some fun. Fun? Betty was staring at him like he was flipping. You know what I did before this? Betty shook her head, which gave LJ time to come up with his latest previous vacation. He looked down and saw the fine-looking leather boots Betty was wearing. They were all covered in dirt and sand, but they still looked good. Walmart, he said. Ladies' shoes. Ladies' shoes? Betty sounded like she didn't believe it, which made sense since it wasn't any more true than anything else LJ had said to folks. But he didn't think saying street hustler was going to make this any kind of real booty call. Also made it hard to take him seriously as a savior of humanity and such. He nodded. Ladies' shoes? So you see this? He waved his hand around. It's not so bad. Betty burst out laughing. You are crazy, LJ. 
So I've been told. Hey, what's it stand for? What? LJ. He smiled. Lloyd Jefferson. My mama named me after both my grandfathers. Never knew them. They was dead before I was born, but mama really loved both of them. LJ shook his head. He hadn't thought about mama in years. He'd never had the chance to make peace with her after the stuff with the pyramid scheme. Now she was dead, at least that was what he figured. Since she lived in Raccoon, and LJ was pretty sure he was close personal friends with everyone who got out of that place breathing. Betty leaned over and rested her head on LJ's shoulder. It was the good one, thank God. He put his arm around her. Mom named me Elizabeth after the Queen of England. LJ looked down at the top of her head. For real? She nodded. She was watching something on TV and she thought she looked a whole nice and regal. And she thought the name sounded like someone important. Snorting, she added, That didn't work too good. I hated the name from when I was five, insisting on Betty. I don't think anybody's called me anything but that since Mom died. How'd she die? She was lucky. It was before this all happened, cancer got her. She looked up at him. What about your mama? At first, LJ didn't want to talk about it. The fact that he and Carlos were survivors of Raccoon City wasn't something they advertised. Not for any good reason. They just didn't like talking about it much. But he figured he wasn't going to be around much longer, so he said, She got blowed up. I'm from Raccoon City, and Mama was there when they hit it with the nuke. Betty sat up. That really happened? They really bombed it? It wasn't a meltdown? Girl, I was there. Trust me. Wasn't no nuclear meltdown. That was the Umbrella Corporation dropping a cruise missile or something on our butts. He shook his head. Me and Carlos were lucky. Carlos is from Raccoon, too? He nodded. Damn. She lay back down in LJ's arms. I was going to ask why you didn't say, but I guess you had good reason, huh? Yeah. LJ stared at the lightning from the storm, which was moving closer. Yeah. She had been born Dahlia Julia Mancini, and there wasn't a single one of those names she was willing to be called in public. Her friends mostly called her DJ, but she didn't really like that either, since it made her sound like she should be on a radio station or something stupid like that. When everything went to hell, she'd been working in a Kmart, and eventually she just holed up there, along with the other employees and most of the surviving citizenry of Athens. At least for a while. Eventually, everyone died. There was one old guy who had heart condition, and as soon as he died, he turned and started biting everyone else. It got worse and worse, but the survivors managed to get the upper hand, mostly thanks to Kmart's gun counter. But when it was all over, there was just DJ and four others. Before too long, they all died too, and from stupid stuff. Charlie got a broken leg, Eileen got an abscessed tooth, and both Yvonne and Willie got the flu. None of those should have been fatal, but they were. That left DJ to fend for herself, living off whatever supplies were left in the giant store. When Claire Redfield and her convoy showed up, it was a lifeline that DJ clutched. She refused to tell them her name. This was a new beginning for her, and it started in that Kmart. Besides, being called that reminded her of the rest of the people who died when she'd survived. They lasted longer than the rest of Athens holed up in that Kmart, and she wanted to remember them a lot more than she wanted to remember that she was named Dahlia Julia Mancini. So when LJ started calling her Kmart, she decided to respond to that only. Now she woke up in the front seat of the Hummer. Something was scratching the roof. Clamoring quietly across the front seat, Claire was still asleep in the back. Kmart slowly opened the door and peered up onto the roof. Nothing. Letting out a breath she hadn't even realized she'd been holding, Kmart started to climb back into the car when something landed on the roof, almost causing her to fall out of the Hummer. Trying to get her heartbeat under control, she saw that it was a crow. But it didn't look like any crow Kmart had seen, and she'd seen plenty. There was something in its eyes, something deadly. Or maybe it was just the poor light. 
Instinctively, she shooed the crow away, and it flew off into the pre-dawn sky. It went past a half-buried car that Kmart didn't remember seeing there before. It probably had been all buried before, but the storm last night had been pretty fierce and windy, and that probably unearthed the vehicle. That wasn't what concerned Kmart, though. She was a lot more worried about where the crow was going. It flew and landed on the motel, right alongside several hundred other crows. It wasn't a trick of the early morning light. They all had crazy eyes, almost milky white, like the zombies. Kmart had lived with watching the world go to hell. She'd watched all her friends and family die, many of them for really stupid reasons. She'd been menaced and almost killed by zombies, and she never cried or screamed, not once. At the sight of hundreds of demonic crows, she screamed. She clambered back into the Hummer. Claire was rousing. Claire, I think we have a problem, she said, pointing at the motel roof. Claire followed her finger and looked at the crows. What the hell? she muttered. Then she reached forward and grabbed the PRC. Carlos? I see it. Carlos's voice sounded calm as always. LJ's much less calm voice came over the PRC speaker's. What the hell? Kmart asked. What's wrong with their eyes? Frowning, Claire said. They've been feeding on infected flesh would be my guess. Carlos said. Everyone stay in the trucks. Kmart looked up. More and more crows were arriving, perching on the motel, the motel sign, the unburied car, and anywhere else they felt like it. One or two even landed on the sentinels. Now Chase came on the PRC. What's going on? Sounding frustrated, Claire said, Everyone just stay in your trucks. Roll up your windows and keep quiet. The crows kept coming. It reminded Kmart of a documentary she saw on the fairy penguins in Australia that all come in out of the ocean at sunset. The penguins just kept piling out of the water in waves, no pun intended. And that's what the crows were doing. More and more kept coming taking up every available surface. Another documentary came back to her, and she said to Claire, They're territorial. We just have to stay calm and keep quiet. How do you know that? Kmart shrugged. Saw it on the Discovery Channel. Claire snorted. I hope they know that. Then she grabbed the PRC. Everyone stay calm, keep quiet, and don't move. If we're lucky, they'll get bored and move on. LJ said, Yeah, and if we ain't lucky, we're in a damn Alfred Hitchcock movie. Otto added, Claire, you look a little like Tippy Hedren. Actually, in fact, when Otto's pause went on a bit too long, Claire said, Otto? Whispering into the PRC, Otto said, We got one on the hood. Looking over, Kmart saw that one crow had indeed landed on the school bus's hood. It seemed fascinated by the crack in the windshield, a lot more than it was with the wire mesh that protected the bus. Again, Otto's whisper came over the radio. Everyone stay still and quiet. More crows started flying to the bus hood. Damn it, Claire said. She clambered all the way into the front, settling into the driver's seat. Kmart sat next to her and tried very hard not to panic. Then, for the second time in five minutes, a loud noise made her jump out of her skin. This time it came over the radio, and it sounded like a can clanking to the floor of a school bus. A little kid's voice, Kmart couldn't tell who it was, said, Sorry, in a whisper over the PRC. But that was quickly drowned out by the crows on the bus hood cawing. And then, all the other crows cawed back in unison in response. We are so screwed, Kmart said, even as the crows started to fly into the air and circle the camp. Claire was turning the Hummer's engine over. Fire them up, let's get out of here. All the other vehicles sprang to life. Chase started the Unco truck. Either Betty or LJ started the ambulance. Mikey fired up the news truck. Otto the school bus, which caused more cawing, and Carlos was probably driving the 8x8. The crows kept circling. L.J. Wayne knew he was going to die, 
and soon. He just didn't want it to be this way. After fighting zombies for all these years, after surviving Raccoon getting nuked, after Idaho and Detroit and Indiana and Toronto, and that goddamn loony bin in Oklahoma, getting taken down by crows was just weak. The crazy crows were turning into some kind of tornado in the sky. As soon as Claire said the word, they were out of there. Betty strapped herself into the driver's seat and hit the ignition, and nothing happened. The engine was roaring away, but the ambo wasn't moving. This did not give LJ warm and fuzzy feelings. Damn it, Betty yelled. LJ could see that she was flooring the gas pedal. What the hell's going on? We're stuck. Peering out the window, LJ saw that the big storm had buried the ambo in sand. Then he looked up and saw that the rest of the convoy was booking out, and they needed to follow. He opened the door with one hand and grabbed Betty's arm with the other. Come on! Betty looked at him for a second, looked at his hand on her arm, and finally nodded yes. They both ran out of the ambulance and headed toward the nearest vehicle, Otto's school bus, which had a back entrance and everything. Outside, the crazy crows were making loud flapping noises. The only flapping LJ had ever really heard in his life was from pigeons, so it was a noise he always figured to be annoying, but not scary. But thousands of crazy crows flapping their wings was scary. He couldn't help looking up and was real sorry he did, because a bunch of them crows was heading right for him. Whipping out his Beretta, he fired bullets into them. Betty did the same next to him, but it was like shooting into a pond. Even if they had hit one or two of them birds, there was still hundreds of them mothers. One of the kids in the back saw them running and opened the emergency exit in the back for them. Betty leapt up onto the stair and ran in, LJ right behind her. Then he shut the door just as the crows went crashing into the back door with a splat. LJ had seen some seriously disgusting stuff in his time, so a bird going kamikaze into a school bus wasn't anything, but Betty and the kids screamed like they'd seen a monster. Running to the front of the bus, LJ and Betty saw that the rest of the birds were doing the same dive-bombing act, slamming their beaks into the windshield and the side windows. It was like it was night all over again, with them crazy crows surrounding the school bus like locusts. Then the bus lurched and crashed to a halt. LJ stumbled forward and half the people in the bus fell on their faces. Otto hit his head on the steering wheel. Rubbing his forehead, he turned around and said, We hit something. No kidding, LJ said. Then the windshield cracked. Betty ran up to stand next to the driver's seat and held the windshield in place. LJ was right behind her, standing in the stairwell to the front door. Help us, Betty yelled. Freddie, Jared, Blair, and Dylan all ran forward and helped Betty, Otto, and LJ brace the windshield. Unfortunately, some of them crows got in through the side windows. Dylan broke off and pulled out his Glock and started shooting. LJ was about to call him crazy when he remembered that Dylan was the one who was a better shot than Carlos. Over the PRC, LJ heard Kmart crying out Claire's name and Claire responded, Damn it! LJ hoped that meant that the cavalry was getting their butts in gear. The kids were all cowering at the back, screaming their heads off. LJ saw a couple of crows heading for him, so he ran back and grabbed them, dashing their bird brains out on the bus wall. At least one of them, the other one, started pecking at his wrist, the same one he told Carlos he'd sprained, and LJ winced at the pain as he slammed the bird into the wall. Jared, no! LJ turned to see Jared panic and opened the bus door. Running toward the motel, Freddy pulled the door shut, but they could see Jared running away and getting swarmed by a dozen or so crazy crows. Shaking his head, LJ realized this wasn't a Hitchcock flick. It was a biblical plague. He also saw that what they'd hit was a telephone pole that had smashed the grill. This bus wasn't going anywhere. And then Claire's beautiful voice came over the walkie-talkie. Carlos, get that truck here. We have to evac the bus. You got it. About time. LJ heard a squeal of brakes from behind the bus and saw the news truck screech to a halt behind the bus. Two seconds later... The 8x8 backed through a fence and came roaring in. 
That would have made LJ laugh if he was somewhere else, because Carlos was always showing off like he had something to prove. Jason climbed up to where the flamethrower was mounted on the 8x8, but then the crows nailed him. LJ winced, even as Kenny didn't waste any time in taking his place while Monique opened the gas taps. Kenny covered Carlos with the flamethrower after he ran out of the 8x8 with a 12-gauge in his hand. Mikey threw open the back of the news truck. The children, he shouted, get them over here. Joel and Cliff opened the bus's back door and started shepherding the kids out with Carlos's shotgun, Kenny's flamethrower, and Richard on the machine gun in the back of the 8x8. They kept the birds off the kids while they ran out to the news truck. Gonna be cramped as hell in here, but it beats getting eaten alive by crows. They'd already lost Jason and Jared. LJ was screwed if he was going to let any birds take anybody else. He'd die first. To hell with that. He was dead already. Everyone else deserved a shot to live. Claire showed up out of nowhere and helped the kids get to Peter, Michael, Dorian, and Erica, who were with Mikey in the news truck. Crows was dropping like flies, but they kept coming. Hearing a scream, LJ looked up to see Richard get taken out by 30 crows. The scream lasted only a few seconds. That made it worse. LJ swore he wasn't going to let nobody else die. He grabbed the first kid, Lil Evan, who was petrified. The poor little kid was so messed up by all this. And carried him out. Just as he stepped down from the back of the bus, he turned around to see Otto, Dylan, and Betty holding the windshield back. Freddie and Blair were lying dead on the floor. LJ hadn't even noticed them dying. Betty! He cried out. She hesitated. From next to her, Otto said, Go! Get out of here! On the other side of her, Dylan just nodded. Betty started to object, but Otto, who was bleeding from the head now, yelled, Go! LJ could see Betty gritting her teeth. LJ was doing the same damn thing. He just sworn nobody else would die, and now Otto and Dylan were sacrificing themselves. Betty was running to the back just as the windshield started to give. Then she stopped. She got down on her knees and started reaching under a seat. There was another kid. The windshield collapsed and LJ lost sight of Otto and Dylan. Two more to add to LJ's list of people who shouldn't have died while he kept on living. Get out of there, he cried to Betty. But she was still reaching under the seat, even with the crows pecking at her. Finally, Sebastian who was always tugging on LJ's beard, climbed out. Come on with me, Betty screamed, ignoring the crows flying all around her. Cradling Sebastian to her, she ran to the back, crows ripping her apart, pecking at her great hair and her pretty face, and there was blood everywhere. Come on, hurry, LJ yelled. LJ's heart sank as she handed Sebastian over, and then she slammed the back door shut. Go, she said as she closed it. No! Tears streaming down into his beard, he picked up Sebastian and ran to the news truck. Sebastian started pulling on LJ's beard. As soon as he jumped into the crowded rear of the news truck, Carlos yelled, Go! The door slammed shut into LJ's face, and he wished the virus would take him already, because he didn't want to be living in the world no more. Screw surviving, if this was what it meant. The kids all safe, Carlos ran to the 8x8, even as the crows, those that weren't trapped in the bus by Betty's heroism, descended upon Kenny, who was already bloody and battered and still firing the flamethrower. Monique lay dead and bloody next to him. As the crows overwhelmed Kenny, the flamethrower spun wildly around. An arc of fire headed straight for Carlos. He had only a microsecond to hope that his death would be quick. Then, suddenly, the flames split. Going around Carlos, he felt the heat on his face as the fire went around him, as if he was a rock in the middle of a river. Then the fire started to twist and spiral as if it had a mind of its own, or rather, a mind controlling it. Looking around, Carlos caught sight of the one person he knew who could do this sort of thing. Alice. She stood about twenty feet away, a bunch of saddlebags and weapons at her feet. Her arms were at her sides, and her blue eyes were fluttering back and forth like crazy. The fire split off several more times, 
each tendril of flame of greater intensity than the original shot from the flamethrower that almost killed Carlos, each shot straight at one of the crows. Soon the sky was ablaze, literally. Strangled caws of dying crows filled the air as they all caught fire and fell to the ground, scorched and dead. Carlos held up his arms to protect his face from being singed by the ones that fell a little too close. Seconds later, it was over. Otto, Betty, Freddy, Dylan, Jared, Blair, Kenny, Monique, Jason, and Richard were all dead. The school bus which was damaged probably beyond their ability to repair, but the crows were gone too, thanks to Alice. Her eyes normal now. She walked over to him with that damn smirk on her face. You miss me? Carlos shook his head as he stared at the woman he hadn't seen since Detroit. Well, I'll say one thing for you. You still know how to make an entrance. The smirk blossomed into a full smile. Then she fell over and Carlos reached out to catch her. Her eyes were fluttering again, but this time it was behind closed lids. The effort of saving the lives of those few who had survived had done her in. He shook his head and snorted a bitter laugh. Welcome back, Alice. Chapter 20 Another spike in alpha and beta waves detected. 45% probability that this is Project Alice. Triangulate, Isaac said to the White Queen in an intense tone. Find her location. I am familiar with the definition of the word triangulate, Dr. Isaacs. The White Queen said in a snotty tone that, were she a real child, would have led Isaacs to have her drowned. Rather than respond to the comment, he called up a graphic of the waveform of Project Alice's second psionic outburst. This one was similar, but the frequency was shorter, and the amplitude much higher, almost as if it were more focused. Impressive, he muttered. If it is her, her development is extraordinary. Her powers would appear to have grown at a geometric rate since her escape at the Detroit facility. Isaac winced. He preferred not to be reminded of the debacle in Detroit. He wondered if the AI did that deliberately after his triangulating comment. The door to Isaac's lab opened then, which irked him. Only one person in this facility had the authorization to override the privacy seal, and that he had it was a source of grievance to Isaacs. Sadly, his protests had, as usual, fallen on uncaring ears. Switching off the image of the waveform, which he had no interest in sharing, he turned to see the irritating face of that person, Alexander Slater, who was holding a digital clipboard and looked as if he'd sucked down a particularly sour lemon. You've made ten trips to the surface in the last twenty-four hours, Slater said without preamble, all unauthorized. Any trip to the surface, especially to gather fresh specimens, puts my men at risk. We've already lost Timson and Moody, and we almost lost a couple more on your last trip. Why do you need so many all of a sudden? Isaac snorted. His men, indeed. Technically, as second in command, he was in charge of personnel, but everyone on this base was Isaac's responsibility, not Slater's. To answer the question, since ignoring Slater would not make him go away, Isaac said, My research has intensified. What does that mean, exactly? Coming to a realization, Isaac sighed. If he didn't give Slater something, he'd go over Isaac's head to Wesker, and that simply wouldn't do. At least not yet. So he deopaked the window on the far side of the lab. Now Slater could see the testing room, where fourteen undead that had been mutated by the same process that had been used on Hockey Jersey were leaping about, screaming and throwing themselves against the walls and windows. Two hit the window, causing Slater to jump back in shock. My God, this is madness! Don't worry, Isaac said. They're perfectly secure. Yeah, I'm sure Timson and Moody thought the same thing. He walked up to the window just as one of them threw a chair against the window. Made of plastic glass as it was, it didn't budge. Slater shook his head. 
You're supposed to be domesticating them. Sometimes aggression has its uses. He saw no reason to admit to Slater that the domestication protocols had utterly failed. But sometimes, the best successes came out of failure. What could you possibly need these things for? If Isaacs had ever been in any danger of mistaking Slater for an intelligent human being, that question eliminated the possibility forevermore. With the world as it was, how could anybody not see the value of such creatures? Before he could say anything, however, the White Queen spoke up. Dr. Isaacs, Specimen 87 has reached the final stage of the test grid. Perfect, Isaacs said, grateful for the distraction from Slater's stupidity. Put her on screen. He reopaked the window to the testing room. Slater moved to stand behind Isaacs as the flat screen monitor lit up with an image of Alice 87, wearing the red dress and boots that she had worn during the disaster in the hive. Walking down the recreation of the Raccoon City Hospital, she pushed a gurney down a corridor and watched as the tripwire sliced the gurney in half. At least this one had outperformed the 86th one. Then she sidestepped the mine, avoiding being shredded by it, which put her ahead of 85 as well. Alice 87 proceeded toward the front door cautiously, as if expecting more trouble. That was a wise thought on her part, as what would have been the door to the street opened to reveal Hockey Jersey, who screamed and leapt at Alice 87, eviscerating her with his bare hands. Behind him, he heard Slater gasp, and make a guttural noise. While Isaacs understood the reaction, one didn't often see someone tear apart a human body by hand. The ability of Hockey Jersey to do what he just did at the slightest provocation proved remarkable and thrilling. Did Slater truly have to ask what use these new improved undead would have? These weren't biohazards. These were soldiers. Soldiers who would fight in Isaac's army. Is Chairman Wesker even aware of this? Another point against Slater, since the answer should have been blindingly obvious. He knows what he needs to know. Or what you choose to tell him. You've overstepped your bounds. This is sedition. Isaacs was unconcerned. True, Umbrella had become its own nation, for all intents and purposes, so the word sedition could apply. But he didn't acknowledge Slater's authority to charge him with such a crime. My research here will change the face of everything. Everything! Slater looked at the flat screen, then at the opaqued window, then at Isaac's. He shook his head and started to leave. If you pick a side, Isaac said to his retreating form, be sure it's the right one. That stopped Slater in his tracks. After a second, he recovered and left the lab. Isaac's went back to work. He would take care of Slater in due course.